Sounds good. Okay. Hello. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another show, another podcast with me. My name is Cherie, and hopefully I'm your favorite lender. So you all know that I love to bring people on for my investor clients to come and talk about how they're investing, the things that they're investing in, and give you some insights with regards to how you can build a cash flowing portfolio. Tonight is no different. I have Brad here. Hello. Welcome. Hey, Sheree. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So first of all, why don't you introduce uh, yourself to everybody and let them know who you are and how you got involved in real estate. Cool. Uh, so my name is Brad Cohen. I am in Harrisonburg, Virginia, small college town uh, on or in the beautiful Shenandoah Valley. Uh, I am an agent and investor in this area, have been since I went to JMU, uh, if you've heard of it. Um, and I've been here for 10 years. I started in student housing, uh, just working on the property management side of things, kind of just fell in love with real estate. Uh, don't really come from a real estate family, but fortunately uh, got kind of tripped and fell into it. And it's been kind of just snowballing from there. Uh, got my license when I was a junior at JMU, started selling my first or uh, before I actually graduated. Uh, and then I have kind of built and compounded my business from there. So what made, what made you get your license? Because uh, uh, most people, when they're a junior in college, they're still either trying to figure out what they're going to do or, you know, um, I don't think there is a, hey, come get your real estate license <laughs> pathway, not especially typically. when you and I were in college, right? So no, not typically. So um uh, I tip or uh, I'm, I'm from the Northern Virginia area. So I, I definitely know that market really well, have a lot of connections up that area, but I knew I didn't want to go back there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, or at the time that I was in college, I was working about 30, 40 hours a week for the student housing company, realized I kind of had a knack for talking to people, taking them on tours of the property. And I was like, oh, maybe this could be like a cool opportunity for real estate. Uh, and when I was looking for off-campus housing for myself, my parents kind of sparked my interest in investment property, offering to go in on an investment property with me for me to live in off-campus. And they basically said, you know, if you find the property, do the research, figure out what you can afford, you pay us rent, and then you manage the property, renting it to your other you know, at the time, fraternity brothers, Right. Uh, little did they know they did not want to rent to fraternity guys, but whatever. Uh, they were like, do you want to rent to your other or roommates? If you keep track of everything, you coordinate the maintenance, stuff like that. Then when you graduate, we'll gift you your equity in the property. Um, and I was like, wow, that seems kind of interesting. And that kind of mm -hmm. piqued my interest to just start running financial calculators. And honestly, what I really did was I started running a bunch of calculators on the frat houses around Harrisonburg, where you had anywhere from 10 to 20 guys living together. And I was a communications major. So like finance was definitely not in the cards for me. And it really, it's the first thing that ever kind of caught my attention and really captivated me when I started running calculators. And I was like, man, if you could buy this thing for this, like you're, you're making really great money on this. So um, that was really how I kind of tripped and fell into it. And 
that kind of inspired me. I didn't know the difference between being an investor, being an agent at the time. I was just like, all right, well, I'll just go get my real estate license. We'll figure it out. Um, so took my time that I was allocating uh, in between courses and everything else and uh, just kind of started to build a portfolio, build a sphere of influence and get to sell them from there. Well, first of all, I love the fact that your your parents sparked the investor in you, you know, and um, actually showing you this is a pathway. Um, the second thing is don't sleep on communications degrees. Not that I have one, I have a business degree, but sometimes people, when they study finance, because I, again, have a, a business degree, we are not taught the art of communication and how to communicate financial um, uh, concepts in yeah. layman's terms. So the fact that you were actually doing both to me was very smart. Yeah, it, know uh, it. <laughs> it worked out. I mean, it worked out really well. And yeah. honestly, I always jokingly tell people, I'm like, oh, I took a really easy course load, but that gave me an extra 30 hours a week that I could be working. Right, right. Uh, absolutely. So those soft skills really helped uh, kind of grow during that time period. And I got comfortable mm -hmm. talking to people that I probably shouldn't have been comfortable talking to at 20 mm -hmm. years. So, but that's um, great. That's great. I, I love that. So after you graduated from college, why did you decide to continue uh, down this path? Like, uh, first of all, what was the path? You know, cause I know now you own a lot of different types of properties, but you know, right after college, what was your next buy? What did you decide to do? Or did you decide to go full into being a realtor? Um, yep. Yeah. So uh, I went full scale just right into being a real estate agent. Uh, I was still working uh, in it, or I, I was still working and managing uh, a shared portfolio of about 100 properties uh, with another property manager in my previous company. Mm -hmm. and we, we just provided the service for the most part. Um, but that gave me a really good insight into what investors look for in our market and different types of investing, um, student housing versus non-student housing. Uh, what are the different reasons why somebody would consider one versus the other, which was really invaluable for our market where, you know, there is a very large student population. Mm -hmm. um, that said, uh, my first year I sold 27 homes. Uh, and so I got very busy. That's actually good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that kept me going. And uh, I was very, very fortunate, very blessed in that regard. And so I just decided I was going to, you know, real estate's one of those businesses. The longer you're in a market, the more people, you know, the more it compounds on itself, the more opportunities that just kind of find their way to you. So that's why I decided to stick it out and just kind of keep rolling and, building my business from here. Mm -hmm. uh, my first purchase for me was just a starter townhouse uh, for myself to live in. My original plan was that I was just going to kind of move every two years and just house hack it. Essentially, I had a roommate who was paying me like 700 bucks a month in rent. So, uh, you know, I was living at a fraction of what the cost I really would have been Uh and he was kind of paying a chunk of the mortgage. So that really or worked out really well. Uh, then basically took that townhouse, parlayed it into a flip opportunity that I went and lived in so I could avoid the capital gains on that. Uh, and then parlayed that one into my eventual primary residence where I operate a short-term rental out of it as well. Very good. So, um, so Going back then to the student housing, because um, a lot of people are very interested in either student housing or room rentals or things like that, especially because of the affordability issue with so many people uh, with, you know, these days. So uh, you mentioned student housing and then non-student housing. When you say non-student housing, do you mean like housing for teachers or housing for just conventional and... rentals as a whole. Um, oh, okay. All yeah, right. So our market, I mean, that it seems silly to divvy it up that way, but typically mm -hmm. when get investors call me in Harrisonburg. I'm like, okay, do you want to rent to students or no? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that's the first question. And I kind of call it student housing versus conventional housing. I got it. So okay. Just your typical rentals, whether you want uh, just single family homes, townhouses, multifamilies, stuff like that. Uh, mm -hmm. But 
who is your target audience that you are trying to rent to and what types of headaches do you want to deal with? Uh, Because we have a huge student population in the area, but that generally lends itself to more maintenance and Mm -hmm. some people and generally more frequent turnover. So that's the conversation I have with my investors around here is like, what are you really going for? Is this a cash flow play? Is this a long-term appreciation play? What are your ultimate goals? So if somebody wants long-term appreciation versus cash flow, like what are some of the things that you suggest for them to uh, consider with regard to their portfolios? So if you're going for more longer term appreciation, as it pertains to my market in particular, I generally direct people actually more towards the conventional side away from student housing. Okay. Uh, student housing cash flow is better just because you can rent by the door and it's like both a joint and several lease. So you're renting, you know, let's say if you've got a four bedroom place, you're going to rent it for 2000. Uh, you know, you've got 500 bucks per student, right? And That might cash flow a little bit better on paper when you don't account for the maintenance component. Mm -hmm. Uh, But generally speaking, student housing is driven entirely by cash flow. So the value associated with it and how much it's going to appreciate over time is driven entirely by what the market rents are. And for our area where we have a lot of corporately owned student housing, that can work out well sometimes, but in my experience, just what I've seen from how much do they go up in a given amount of time, they don't generally appreciate quite as fast as the rest of the real estate market as a whole. Mm. So, you know, if you're willing to forego a li- or a couple hundred bucks extra for cash flow on a month by month basis, and you go with the conventional housing side of things, you know, just buying a single family home and renting it out or buying townhouses, townhouses are a huge opportunity in our market. Uh, people do really, really well with them because we're a very, very growing market and there's a lot of demand on the rental side of things Mm -hmm. because we just don't have a whole lot of like corporate investment or large scale investment in a multifamily. It's all targeted around student housing. So there's a shortage of just conventional rentals for people. And that's caused our rental rates to be what I would consider to be pretty asinine uh, being from Northern Virginia but you get really, really high rent. So you're still going to have that kind of cash flow play. Uh, but generally speaking, if you're looking at the conventional side of housing, at least in our market, it follows the overall market appreciation and trends, whereas student housing is purely that cash flow play. Right. So are you saying that in comparison to Northern Virginia, that, well, it, I would think that the housing prices themselves are much lower. lower. Much lower. Yes, much lower. However, with conventional housing, you can still make more cash flow than you could in Northern Virginia because Price the, to rent. rental, the print, rental rates are on par. Price to rents. And we saw a lot of that. We saw a lot of that uh, coming out of the COVID era and have still uh-huh. seen a lot of that with a lot of Northern Virginia investors uh, that look at their market and they say, oh, you know, there's not much that I can do up here. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm trying, if if I can only afford to buy something at this price range, or I can only allocate this much cash, there's only so much that they can do. Right. So they start looking more regionally. And a lot of people like Harrisonburg, because we're right on the I-81 corridor, we're a growing market, we're two hours to DC, two hours to Richmond, two hours to Roanoke. So it's very accessible to the rest of the state. Mm -hmm. Position cost you know, is much lower, but right, if you right. look at the price to rent ratios, they're, they're fairly comparable, all things considered. Yeah. So there's a lot of good opportunities. And then, you know, everybody likes growing markets. If you're thinking about long-term appreciation for something that you want to buy, you know, if you get into a market that's a lower acquisition cost now, but has a lot more people moving to it, then mm-hmm. obviously, you know, supply demand drives appreciation. Right. Well, as somebody who lives in a rural part of Northern Maryland, um, and, you know, it takes me an hour and a half to get to Reston, Virginia, which is where our office is, right? Where I grew up. Like regular traffic. So, um, yeah, so I'm like, okay, four times a year, (laughs) I'll make it down to Reston. Other than that, I'm okay working from home and things like that. Yeah, you will have the person who's like, I don't have sticker shock because these are the same prices I'm paying in Northern Virginia. Um, and the, the, you know, 
four, five, six times I want to go to DC or Richmond or something like that. Four, five, six times a year, I'm okay with that. You know, yep. and and you just you, that's what you do. So I definitely can understand people's point of view with regards to that. Um, now I would imagine that with so many students coming, going, etc., that you would have a lot of parents contacting you saying, I want to do this for my child. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, does that happen? Or is there actually room for more investors to get involved in your market? Yeah. So, I mean, I do get Typically, typically in the fall, because that's when uh, like lease signing season kicks off for the off-campus housing, I typically do get probably a dozen or so calls from parents saying, you know, I'm looking at what I'm going to have to pay to, to, to rent something off campus for my student. And this is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I'm going to have to pay 600 or more dollars for a bedroom, uh, then yeah, I do want to look at what are my other options here. Mm -hmm. And uh there are a couple of like independent like uh, condo communities that are student housing uh, that provide good opportunities for stuff like that. There's also a lot of restrictions. And this is kind of why you always want to work with somebody who's like an expert in your local market, because like city of Harrisonburg is very particular that you can't just buy any old single family home and rent it to four students just because mm -hmm. there's four bedrooms. Uh, they try to really keep the residential neighborhoods, residential and the student housing, student housing. So there's not as much commingling there. Uh, yes, we see yes, it a lot in my neighborhood. Make sure those property values keep going up. So Well, yes. and nobody <laughs> likes to have a frat party in their backyard. Uh, you've seen the movies or seen the movie Neighbors. But um, so, you know, there's, there's certainly opportunities uh, and there's a lot of opportunities for investors to look at just like, what are those, what are those like non-traditional student housing opportunities? Because there's a couple of like simple townhouse communities where you don't want to be in like party city and, you know, uh, around a ton of students. You want more of a quiet neighborhood that may not have as many restrictions on it. So that gives you some opportunities to buy a townhouse. And, you know, if you guys have a three bedroom townhouse, you rent it to three students, you do pretty well from a cash flow standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, did I answer your question? <laughs> Yeah, so we were just talking overall about um, about the opportunity for opportunities for people, uh, especially in our area, Northern Virginia, to actually participate. You know, are you oh, getting yeah. floods of phone calls from people? Is it uh, uh, inventory? Is the inventory tight or tighter in your area because you have so many? incoming freshmen every year that your phone is ringing off the hook or is there really opportunity that was the yeah. question yeah so i mean there's definitely opportunities i will say they are kind of limited just because of the restrictions the city puts in place but when they pop up they're typically very highly coveted um, mm -hmm. you don't see you know frequent turnover in those traditional student housing investment opportunities and then mm -hmm. if you can get your hands on one of the or one of the you know, one of the houses that has been quote unquote grandfathered in non-conforming, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. whatever your term is for it. Mm -hmm. um, if you can get your hands on those, they're typically rare because they're typically cash cows. Um, but if you have a student who's, you know, coming to JMU, when you start looking at it, like living on campus, unfortunately, I mean, fortunately, unfortunately, JMU only has so much housing available. So there's only a certain number of people who can live on campus for more than one year and everybody typically moves off. Mm -hmm. So, and, and because you have a lot of corporately owned, uh, you know, Blackstone-esque student housing venture or VC groups that own student housing in our area, you know, there's only some isolated opportunities, but those drive a lot of really higher rents. And so if you're an independent, you know, you're an independent owner, odds are you're probably going to end up coming out ahead when it's all said and done. Because just, if, I mean, the, the same concept with all of us as real estate investors, right? You buy a property, hoping that it will appreciate over time, but at a minimum, you're paying down, you're taking equity out of your pocket, or excuse me, you're taking that need payment for housing out of your pocket and putting it back into your pocket in the form of equity. Right. Um, and so even when you take into account selling costs and, you know, maybe a three-year turnaround from sophomore to senior and selling the property, people do really well for the most part, because if you're paying rent, you're going to flush down the drain regardless. <laughs> 
That is true. That is true. So, I mean, it's always, I feel like people, everybody should own something, you know, I know that always. there's a, a growing trend of people who say, oh, I don't, I don't want to necessarily own where I live, but okay, well, own something uh, is, yeah. is what we're always talking about. And the truth is, it, it really is about growing a portfolio of, of properties as well. So, um, so what other investments are you doing that you're kind of super excited about that you would want people to know about and even think about doing for themselves? So uh, I've got my hands in a couple of different pockets. Um, like I said, I parlayed my first townhouse into a live-in flip that I did, and there's still opportunities for like or for those in our market. I know that gets scarce depending on market by market of what you're working in, but we do have the occasional distressed property that'll pop up. Uh, fortunately, you know our market's very stable and sheltered from a lot of the like kind of peaks and valleys of the mm -hmm. overall economic system. So that's another reason why somebody might consider investing here. But um, for me, I did the one live-in flip, which was a huge learning opportunity because I GC'd it myself and uh, I was living in the chaos during that whole process. And uh, that was by no means a small flip. Um, oh, it was like every bit of $100,000 worth of work, um, mold it's remediation, kind of structural work. I mean, pretty much we touched everything in the house except for the roof. Oh, uh, so I mean, it was a big project, but a great learning experience. And that made it that much easier to go into uh, the next one that mm -hmm. I, I just, or I did one uh, this past year with a partner. I've got uh, partners in that are on the construction side that have a construction business and we've done one together and they've done a couple others as well. Um, so excited about those types of opportunities as they, sh or as they show up, but we're very particular. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I always said the or the challenge with being both an agent and an investor is you always want to see optimistically for how things could play out, right? It's like, oh yeah, there's like, oh, this looks like a great deal. And then you have blinders because if you're also representing buyers and sellers, you see so many of like the horror stories of how it can go. Yeah. Uh, so we, we get a little pixie choosy with uh, the types of deals that we're looking for. Um uh, and then the other thing that I've got my hands in right now is I mentioned I've got a short-term rental that I'm operating uh, out of my home or out of my primary residence uh, here in downtown Harrisonburg. We've just got a little 400 square foot studio uh, that we lease out. It was our detached garage uh, that we built out and converted. And that's turned into probably my best investment to date because it pays our whole mortgage. So, Very you know. Cool. You heard the or the heard the trend of house hacking. House hacking has mm -hmm. always kind of been my means to building wealth. And I'm only 29, so I'm young. <laughs> you are young. Yes. You look, you have plenty of time. So uh and it's it's interesting because I'm working right now with a couple of house hackers, especially one person I was working with earlier today, where he bought his first house actually February of last year house hacked it. And now he's about to move into a second house. They put in an offer today, he and his realtor for awesome. a second house that he's going to move into and house hack, like, you know, again. So, um, so it's yeah, the best I mean, practice in my opinion, I mean, especially for young people, uh, Yeah, if you're young, especially if you're young and single. And the other thing that I learned from one of our other realtor partners is like, I, as a woman was always concerned about house hacking. Cause I said, or because I understood that you can't discriminate against people. And it turns out I can discriminate against people mm -hmm. if they're living with, with if it's me. Your primary like, residence. Oh, yes, primary residence. Because I said, I don't want some guy coming and saying he wants to live with me. And they're like, no, you don't worry about that. You know, you can you can turn people away. I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, you can pick and choose as long as it's your primary, which is always a good opportunity. Yeah. yeah. So um, so yeah, so that's a great thing. And I think that it's, it's, um, an excellent way, especially for single people, um, it's or much easier. it has like a separate entrance for people to be able to bring, um, in extra revenue, you know, within their homes. So, yeah. And I mean, our, uh, when I bought this place, like this is kind of my quote unquote dream or dream home, right. It's way bigger than what me and my fiance need for just the two of us. But, mm -hmm. uh, 
we've got four bedrooms, we've got two and a half bathrooms, we've got like 4,000 square feet all in, like it's plenty of space. But the reason I bought it was really because I saw that detached garage in the backyard. And I was like, Oh, that'll make a great Airbnb and being a block from downtown Harrisonburg, which is where all the tourism, the bars, the restaurants, like it is the kind of like sociocultural hub of the area. Mm -hmm. it, when we get regional travel or if we get JMU parents coming for a football game or something like that, they always want to be right downtown. So from the moment I bought this property, I probably stretched admittedly more than I should have to purchase it initially, but I saw the opportunity and, you know, looking at last year's numbers, it, it basically paid the whole mortgage. Yeah, uh, that's so amazing. for me to be at 29 living for the cost of utilities, uh, and then just doing the hosting and management of the Airbnb, we, we're doing really well with it. Right, right. And I mean, the hosting and management is not so bad because it's on your property. So you just- Oh yeah, exactly. That's the best back. part. I mean, I, like we clean it ourselves because it takes us like 20 minutes between me and my fiance. Like it's yeah. nothing. Yeah. Uh, and to do something like that at your primary makes it a lot easier than having to coordinate vendors. Like Massanutten's really popular around here for short-term rentals, um, kind of got put on the map in the COVID era. Mm -hmm. But- even that, that's 25 minutes away. So, you know, coordinating cleanings and some of those other logistics, like for us, it's like, okay, we got a new person coming in. Let's go flip the sheets and take care yeah. of it. We walk out back and we're done. Yeah. Well, I do want to say as well for people, because you all know, I'm always telling you about the financing. There is a loan, um, whether or not you want to build a detached um, garage or you want to build an ADU, accessory dwelling unit, if you have enough you know, room in your backyard and that's something that you want to do, contact me because we do have a lender who will finance those things for you. So that way you can have something that you can you know, use for short-term rentals or even medium-term rentals is a really big thing right now. Um, that was one that we did actually early on, like before I'd even, and this was kind of crazy, like even before I hit Superhost, which is where you get like bumped in the algorithm and mm -hmm. everything. I had somebody ask me about like a two month rental on it and he was willing to pay kind of what the market rent was for the short term. I was like, yeah, no problem. No turnovers, like mm -hmm. guaranteed income. Life's good. Um, and, and initially when I built it, you know, being in the industry, you hear all the horror stories of moving logistics and like, oh, all of a sudden we now have a one week gap between when you can move or when you have to move out of this one, you can move on your next house. I wanted to be able to provide that to my clients and have mm -hmm. it at their disposal to just be say, Hey, no worries. I got this. Just take my Airbnb for a week. Right. Um, and, and we've done that once or twice too. Makes you it worked super out realtor. really well. I love it. You're a super realtor now. <laughs> You're Something like that. Yes. We're solutions oriented people. <laughs> So for the final question I have is actually about being a realtor. So what are some of your pieces of advice for people who are uh, Asian investors, for example, they're real estate agents, they either are investors or want to be investors uh, in this market based on your success? Oh, that's a loaded question. Good one. Uh, so best advice I can give people right now is just be patient look for the right opportunities. Uh, don't get suckered into something just because you think it's a great deal. Uh, good deals are getting harder and harder to find. You have to look in certain markets or you have to look in different segments of the market. Be patient, uh, especially as an agent investor, because, you know, always remember those blinders, those little, like it's, it, you know, when you're an agent investor, it's your money, mm -hmm. you know, um, even if you're using other people's money and for, you know, for the deals that you're doing, make sure it's one that you feel really confident in and that you're not kind of fudging the numbers just because it may work, you right? Oh, it, I might get 350,000 on the resale. No, run that financial calculator on the 330 figure that you're really, really confident in. I mean, that's a perfect example from, you know, what we did with our flip uh, that we did last year is I was like, okay, I think we might get 350 depending on market conditions, but I'm very confident at 335. So we ran everything based off of that 335. I was like, if we have to take less than that, then something's horribly wrong. So mm -hmm. look for those right opportunities, be patient um, and, and use creative financing. I mean, be willing to try those different things because you never know what circumstances a particular seller is going to be in, in any given circumstance. Yeah. And as an agent in particular and agent or being an agent investor, you've got a lot of opportunities to 
provide solutions for people that other people don't have, right? I mean, when I like when I go into a listing presentation, I can go into it and I can say, hey, here's your suite of options, right? I can put it on the open market. I can make you an offer on it myself. I can fence it out to my network of investors. I can sell it to an iBuyer for you. Make sure that you have all of those ar array of options at your disposal because any or the more prepared you can go into any conversation with a seller, the better off you're going to be. Uh, I pride myself on being a solutions oriented person and, you know, and helping people at a fundamental level spiritually, like why I'm in this business is because I want to help people and I want to get them in from, you know, I want to help them build wealth for themselves and I want them to, you know, and I want to be able to help people out of tough situations when those come up. And, you know, as an investor, that's what we typically deal with. Yeah. Uh, so being nimble, being willing to adapt, uh, knowing your market, working with your local experts, and just being willing to be patient and look for the right deal. That is true. So um, I definitely, uh, especially with the fix and flips, you know, running your numbers, understanding you have closing costs on both sides of the of the um, purchase as well as this resale and and all of that. So. And definitely using us as a resource as well, between Brad, myself, other people in the, the grid community, et cetera. Like, it's okay to have somebody look over your numbers and say, okay, well, don't forget about this. And, you know. Um, Everybody has been there before at mm -hmm. some point. And, you know, using those resources is crucial, right? Yeah. You know, the beautiful thing about real estate investing is there are, you know, the moment you can come to terms with, there are more than enough deals to go around, right? Mm -hmm. Investors have an abundance mindset. They look at it, it's like, oh, I'd rather do 10 deals shared with a couple of people than do one deal just myself, right? right. The, the moment you can recognize that sort of a mindset and be willing to use those resources and share the, and share your own, you know, your own expertise, because not everybody can be a master of everything. And you know, I, I mean, shoot, thinking about short-term rentals. When I got into that, I called my buddy who I knew had four or five of them up at Mass and Up. And I was like, Hey, how are things going up there before mm -hmm. I started perusing those opportunities? So use your experts that, you know, have been there before you, so you don't get, so you don't get screwed. <laughs> right. Right. Absolutely. Well, how can we, how can people, sorry, get in touch with you if they want to uh, potentially invest in your area or use you as a realtor? Uh, I am in Harrisonburg, Virginia, like I said, and uh, you can get me at my website, connexare.com. Uh, my logo is right here for those of you who've been watching. Uh, <laughs> Brad at connexare.com, or if you just Google Brad Co. in Harrisonburg, I guarantee you all pop up. <laughs> uh, I pay a lot of people a lot of money to make sure that that happens. So if that doesn't, then obviously that. Or uh, Instagram is a good way to get me, the underscore Brad Cohen. Perfect. Perfect. And of course, everybody, you know, to co contact either call or text me at 703-951-4419. So thank you so much, Brad, for uh, letting us pick your brain tonight. And um, everybody, we hope to see you on the next video. Take care. Thanks so much, Sheree.